Dinoflagellates definitely suck. So let's reframe the fear of getting them in our tanks with some education so that we know what to do when we first start seeing them show up and be able to beat them without too much fuss. First off, let's get this clear and out of the way. Dinoflagellates are not a death sentence to the tank, or well, they don't have to be if you can do the correct things to keep them at bay. It doesn't actually mean that your tank is failing. It just means that your tank is biologically out of balance. The real problem with dinoflagellates is that they are a symptom of another cause. They are themselves not the root cause of the problem. So what happens a lot of times is people tend to try to deal with the dinoflagellates themselves rather than deal with the actual root cause of the problem, which is that imbalance I talked about earlier. With the right approaches, these things can be beaten. Many, many, many people have beaten them over the years, but it depends on which species you have as to how you need to proceed. And let's talk about it. So what are these things anyway? Dinoflagellates are a single-celled, photosynthetic, sort of algae-like organism that lives in our tanks. They are always there. That's important. It's just that usually they are not the dominant population of microfauna in the tank. But when the tank drops down to very low nutrient zones like zero nitrates and zero phosphates, and you have the presence of high powerful lighting in the tank like most of us run in our reef tanks for corals, that is the perfect storm for the beneficial microbiome that we want, like diatoms, to begin dwindling in population because those things rely on that nitrogen and phosphorus for their life cycle. But the dinos are photosynthetic, so they can live in a low or almost zero nutrient type of situation and be just fine. This gives them a biological advantage in these situations. And one of the biggest causes that I have seen that allows these guys to become the dominant population is using dry rock to set up our aquarium. I recently made a video on the differences between dry rock and live rock and the use of live rock in a new tank cannot be understated. When you're talking about the rocks themselves, they're going to bring in massive amounts of bacteria and microfauna and diatoms in varying species that you just don't get with dry rock. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole video on that here. You can go watch that video if you want to, and I'll put a card up at the top at some point in this video. It might be over there. I don't know. And uh, it'll pop up and you can find the link to that video. But the key point here is that zero nutrients don't actually cause dinoflagellates. It's an indirect sort of cause because of the dwindling of the good microbiome. So what do we do about it? Oh, I should also mention that usually we don't see dinoflagellates as much of a problem in mature tanks. And it's for the same reason as starting a tank, a new tank with live rock. It's because the rock has become established with that biome that we do want. That's why dinos are usually, I said usually, don't come for me if you have an old tank that got them all of a sudden, but usually it happens in newer tanks with lesser experienced reef keepers, which makes them blossom in population, and it's very difficult to keep them contained. After watching this video, you're going to have all the information you need to kick their butts. So let's start going through them one by one, identifying them and talking about what to do. The first step to fighting dinoflagellates is microscopic identification. And I have a video that's going to pop up on the screen at the end of this video talking about that with links to some that I think are pretty good microscopes. You can get a pretty decent one for about a hundred bucks these days, plenty to identify these guys. So let's talk about amphidinium. There are two types of amphidinium, small cell and large cell amphidinium, and they're both fought in the same way. Now, it is very hard to ID dinoflagellates from a visual, just looking at the tank, but generally these appear more like a brown dusty coating, doesn't really have as much slimy strings and stuff like that. You might see some bubbles as with all the dinoflagellates all over your rocks and sand bed. One crappy part about these little dudes is that at night in the dark, they don't go into the water column like some of the other ones that we're going to talk about in a minute. They actually go deeper 
into the sand bed and into the substrate to hide away during the nighttime, and that makes them harder to beat. Because of this and not free swimming in the water column, they don't really respond to UV sterilization. It doesn't matter how strong your UV is because they're not going through it. So here are the main two things that you can do for both of these species, the large and small. Number one, make sure that your nitrates and your phosphates, well, really there's three things. Make sure your nitrates and phosphates are in a good range and ratio. You definitely don't want very low numbers. You want your nitrates up around 10, your phosphates around 0.1, something like that. That's going to provide the fuel for the beneficial bacteria and microfauna to begin growing back in their population again. Number two is to add more beneficial bacteria and microfauna. Copepods are excellent to add, amphipods are good too, and also beneficial bacteria, either something that you get from a bottle, which is debatable how efficacious those are, but it doesn't hurt anything to add them anyway, not at least what we know at this point, or you can get live rock or live sand from the ocean or from a running system and get that into the tank. What we have to do here for these is outcompete them with the good stuff that we do want and make the dinoflagellates die off due to overpopulation of the good stuff. One of the ways that we can do that is by dosing the tank with sodium silicate, also known as water glass. You're looking for a 40% solution of sodium silicate and you're gonna dose that according to the size of the tank. Now there is a link down in the description that is going to take you to a Facebook page. If you join that Facebook page, it's Max Dino Flagellate Support Group. In the files section of that page, there is a couple of charts that you can get. There's a PDF that shows you how to deal with these things. And there's also a chart for the silica dosing. And you can find that there, download that, and go by that guide. Also, it's important to note that overdosing the silicate really doesn't make things happen any faster. You have to dose the correct amount, wait for the diatoms to catch up over time, which unfortunately sometimes can take a couple of months. It is what it is. By the way, my name is Logan and I run Reef Rookies, the most respectful reef keeping community on the internet. We are here on YouTube, over on TikTok, Instagram, and I have a Facebook group called Reef Rookies with Logan with 23 and a half thousand members. And we'd love to see you over there. Post a picture of your tank, say hi to the community. You will get welcomed there and you will not be treated poorly for your beginner or seemingly simple questions. If you do, you let us know and, and we'll boot those uh, rude people quickly. I'd also like to shout out a very special thank you to my YouTube channel members. There are a hundred of you guys now and I have tiers for membership as low as a dollar. So if you find all this information helpful, be sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video, drop me a comment about your experience with dino flagellates and what you did to finally kick them in the butts and if you want to become a channel member, there's a link in the description below. Thanks. Now, when you're looking through your microscope, you can identify the difference between small and large cell amphidiniums pretty easily. Large cell, once you get up to the high power magnification and you're looking at like 2000 X or something like that magnification, they're going to be rather large in your viewfinder. They're, they're going to be pretty big. You know, what, two or three or four or five of them are going to take up a large portion of the, of the view. But the small cell dudes are really, really tiny. If you look at this example, this is small cell amphidinium right next to Osteopsis. And the large cell amphidiniums are similar size to the Osteopsis. So you can see kind of the size difference here. If you're all the way up on your ma magnetism on your microscope and they're still really, really tiny, it's probably small cell amphidinium. So let's switch gears now and talk about prorocentrum. And these are usually pretty easy to identify, even with a basic microscope, because they have a relatively pronounced circular midsection right in the middle of the dyno. Now, typically what you visually see in the tank is like a thick brown mat sort of covering everything. It can kind of look stringy at times, but it definitely is going to have some body to it. It's not just a light dusting on the sand and on the rocks. There's going to be some junk in the tank. Now, 
Similarly to amphidinium, these also don't respond very well to UV. You could run all the UV in the world and you're probably not going to get rid of these and the amphidinium species. These basically do the same thing. They hide away at night. So the sodium silicate dosing thing and adding the beneficial bacteria, the live rock, live sand, that kind of thing. That's the way that you fight these also. And all of that stuff that I mentioned just a few minutes ago, that applies to these as well. So now let's flip and discuss the species that actually do respond to UV sterilization. And with these, using sodium silicate dosing is possible, but it really doesn't help all that much. And the first one is Osteopsis. Now, when you're looking at these under the microscope, they are very easily identifiable because they have a very sharp pointed beak on the end of the dinoflagellate, and it's usually more white in color where the rest of the dino is kind of a goldy brown. Now, typically on visual inspection in the aquarium, these do form long brown strandy strings coming off of your rocks and corals and off the sand bed and pretty much everywhere. At night, these free swim in the water column. They release from the substrate and they just start swimming around all over the tank. So using a properly sized UV sterilizer, usually one watt per gallon is what's recommended, but these guys are armored. So it has been recommended that you go all the way up to three watts per gallon, but that gets very, very expensive for a lot of people if you have any size at all to your tank. And I have had success with even lower wattage, but very long duration times from UV. My UV sterilizer is four feet long and it's only 40 watts. But if I run a really slow gallon per hour, like 80 to 100, that water really slowly moves through that UV and it just cooks their tails. That has worked for me. In a minute, towards the end of the video, I'm going to give you a good tip for how you set up your UV and run it that's going to be really beneficial if you're fighting these guys. It is also very important to note that some of these dinos are actually toxic. So it doesn't really matter which ones I'm fighting. I always put some carbon in the tank just in case. But especially with Osteopsis, you want to be running activated carbon and changing it out weekly while you're fighting these guys because they do release toxins when they die and those toxins can kill fish and invertebrates and even sometimes in high enough concentrations they can kill fish. Now one thing that I have also found very highly effective and I don't usually recommend this but when fighting these things it does seem to help. Once you get the UV sterilizer installed on your tank, you put the tank through a three-day blackout. As I mentioned before, these things swim in the dark. So if you black the tank out, especially when you got the UV on, they go up into the water column and they stay there. And it lets the UV do the thing that it needs to do with these guys swimming. Now do that for about three days. If you have corals, you're going to want to turn the lights back on on the third day. I don't like going four days when I have corals in the tank, they start to decline a little bit. And then leave the lights on for a week, see if they come back. If they do, you can do another blackout for another round of that with UV sterilization, and that usually takes care of it. Generally speaking, these guys, if you have a good UV, about a week or two and you can kick their tails. Now there's another one that's not really talked about very much. It's a fifth type, and this is Coolia. And believe me, they are not cool at all. <laughs> These kind of look like really brown, like short little strandy things coming off all of your sand and your rocks. Under microscopic identification, they just look like little round globs. They don't really have much of a shape to them otherwise or any other identifying characteristics, but they are a dinoflagellate and we do see them in our tanks. Fortunately for us, we deal with these guys exactly the same way as Osteopsis, a good UV sterilizer and a tank blackout makes them swim. And so earlier I mentioned a, a little bonus tip of, about the UV sterilizers and how you run them. It is best to set them up with a pump inside the main display that pumps directly into the UV and then returns directly back to the main display. Now, I don't have mine set up that way because I just didn't have room to do it that way. So I had to loop it in with the sump and it did work but it took about a month for it to work this way for me. I know that it would have worked a lot faster had I done it to and from the main display. Most people, well, I'll say some people at least, hook their UV sterilizer up with hard PVC plumbing where they can literally just hang it right on the front of the tank. 
It's only going to be there for a week or two, and then you're going to take it off and put it away until you need it again. Doing it that way really seems to ramp up how quickly it solves this problem, so that is definitely what I would recommend. There are UV sterilizers out there on the market that are pretty easy to do this with. I'll link a couple down in the description below. You don't have to use the hard plumbing, but it makes it a lot easier to make a U-bend and just hang that thing right on the front or the side or back of the tank. So now let's talk about a little something that is not dinoflagellates at all, but is often misconstrued for dinoflagellates, and that is chrysophytes. They have a golden brown appearance and are pretty easy to identify under microscopy. Uh, at the time of filming the video, I'm still looking for a good picture. If I find one, it'll go up now. And usually what causes these guys are excess silicates coming through an exhausted RODI unit. If you can identify the source of those silicates and eliminate that, and then couple that along with some manual removal, that pretty much takes care of it. These are not toxic like dinos, so you don't have to worry about that, but they are a pain in the butt, and they generally look like a golden to a golden green kind of fuzziness all over the rocks. All right, so now that we have covered all of that and we can identify which species we have, I hope you took screenshots and marked down which ones are which ones. Let's talk about some of the universal guidelines that we can go over to try to help keep these things from ever showing up in the first place or going away quickly if we do get them. The first thing is stop aggressively filtering the tank. We want our nitrates and phosphates to come up. So this happens happens a lot of the time when we set up a new tank and somebody's able to just get all that gear right up front with the filter rollers and the UV sterilizers and the this and the that and the other thing, right? When the tank is not biologically mature, all of that filtration is just not necessary and it can actually harm the process by stripping all those nutrients that we need out of the water way too fast in the beginning of the tank's life. So, cutting back on some of that, removing that filter roller, turning that skimmer off, turning that UV sterilizer off in the beginning could actually be beneficial and let the tank get a little dirtier. Adding beneficial bacteria and phytoplankton to the tank is a great idea. I am partnered with Bulldog Reef and he actually has a diatomaceous phytoplankton blend and you can get that from him if you use code RRWL15, you can get 15% off of a bottle. He also gives veteran and military and first responder discounts. And no, he did not sponsor this video or ask me to say this. I believe he has a good product and I think that it's great for this purpose. So I thought I would mention it. Adding that beneficial bacteria, like I said just a second ago, and then went off on a tangent is a great idea. There are lots of them out there. Microbe Lift Special Blend is a really good one. Microbe Lift Night Out 2, I've used that one a lot. Fritz Turbo Start 900 is very good as well. And there's even some strains of purple non-sulfur bacteria that are coming onto the market. But my point here is, Choose whatever beneficial bacteria you want. I would prefer that you chose live rock or live sand from a system, a running system or the ocean. But if you have to go with something in a bottle, just ask around on the communities, see what people are having good results with, get you some and get it in the tank. Adding copepods is another great way to add low level biodiversity to your food web and your microbiome in your tank. There's tons of places to get copepods from. I am partnered with podyourreef.com and also Bulldog Reef has copepods as well. You can't go wrong at either place. If you want to go through Pod Your Reef, there's a code Reef Rookies. You can use that to get 10% off a bottle. And he also doesn't know that I'm saying this and did not sponsor this video. So listen, here's the brass tacks. We don't fight and kill the dinos directly. We fight them indirectly by bolstering the good biome in the tank and growing the good things that we want and out competing their little brown squirmy butts. And now for that video that I discussed on microscopy, it's right up there. It'll give you some good information on why we need microscopes in this hobby. And I'll see you over there.